Greg, what does being a great session player mean to you? Really, in a, in a nutshell, it's being able to uh, deliver the vision, either the writer or the producer or the artist or whatever, whoever's bringing you into the project. I mean, in, in the end, uh, the whole goal is to help them fulfill the vision they have for, you know, for what they're doing. And it takes a pretty deep musical knowledge to be able to build that skill set. Where did, where did your start from as a kid? When, how did you get introduced to music and start developing that, that knowledge and instinct to be able to deliver an artist's vision? Uh, I, well, <laughs> you know, way back then, I would have had no clue that it was actually developing a <laughs> vocabulary right. to deliver an artist's vision. But, but, you know, at this, at this point in my, in my curve, in my career curve, I look back and, and I absolutely realize that it's literally, Anything I ever heard, anything I ever played, uh, it's all kind of stowed away in there, which is probably why I can't remember anything else. But uh, really, music started for me really, really young, three or four years old, with my, my dad's little brother, my Uncle Dale. His records were some of the first things I heard mm -hmm. as a kid because I'd be at my grandma's house and he and he was there and he would be playing his records. If there's that innate thing in a kid that he's attracted to music or rhythm or or any of that, it fires and it it fired right off the bat for me. So did you drive into drums first as an instrument? Um, yeah, I did. It starts just like with most kids. You're you're beating on everything in the house and and. Your parents are trying to keep the furniture in one piece and you're walking around with, you know, big serving spoons beating on everything <laughs> and beating the stuff and out of footstools and things like that. And so uh -huh. out of self-defense, they, <laughs> they get you something else to beat on. And, you know, for me, it was those old timey little tin drum sets with the paper heads, you know, and they might last until Christmas Day night. You know, they might last that long, maybe. <laughs> and it's like, it's the most frustrating thing. You know, you think, oh, I got a drum, I got a drum. And then it's gone, <laughs> yeah. you know, because you've just beaten it to pieces immediately. You know? Did you play along to records? Oh, uh, eventually, eventually I did. When I, when I, you know, when I finally did get a little record player. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I absolutely played along with records. You know, I'm five or six years old and I, you know, I put the record on and it starts and I'm like, how do they do that? How? How do they just know to start? You know, it's just like they just start all together, just out of the blue. Where I learned how that happens is when I got Meet the Beatles and I saw her standing there. Paul counted the song off. One, two, three, four. And I'm like, ding, 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 ding. <laughs> okay, now I get it. Now how do they all get so quiet at the end? Did you ever end up having um, like traditional drum instruction? My parents... If you're going to do this, you know, we want you should take some lessons and find out what it is you're doing uh -huh. <laughs> if you don't know. I had a female teacher. Her name was Rebecca Doss. I remember her well. But it was like, okay, here's your rudiments. And I'm like, this ain't a song. This is not helping me play my songs. And it's really boring. And these aren't even drums. They're practice pads. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. as a kid, you just yeah, have no filter. Exciting. You don't have a filter. When all of that started, when I got, actually got my drums and all that, it was really at the height of garage band activity. And I lived in a little horseshoe circle. And there were probably three bands in that circle. So at eight and nine years old, I got guys to play with, you know, and we're playing Gloria and Louie Louie and all that stuff and just having a grand old time. By the time we were 10 or 11, we were playing little birthday parties and church functions. And there was a community center down in Midtown in Memphis. We'd play a Friday a month. It was for disabled kids and so they, for, so they could have a dance. So at that point, is it still like a for fun thing? Or are you I, starting think, to see I think at that point, you're talking about that choosing of a career path. It was probably uh, the very first concert I ever went to, and it was Steppenwolf and the Birds and, and a local band called Country Funk. And and we knew the guys in Country Funk because they worked at the music store. And to go there in the Coliseum and and see guys that you knew on that stage, I think that was the thing that said, wow, you know, that— that sure would be cool. So then where, where, did it, where did it go from there? 
Rick's cousin Randy Smith uh, was a little bit older and had and had been in a pretty successful local band, and he was wanting to play again. And we joined him, and his 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 dad was kind of acting as a manager. We called him Uncle Ray. Ray Smith was his name. Just having crossed into teenage years, and you know that's when you know everything. I mean, that's yeah. I mean, you you never know more than you knew when you were thirteen. Oh yeah. He would try to make the point to us. You know, we don't want to limit our availability and, and the kind of work we can do. You know, we can do country clubs. We can make good money. You know, we we would do country clubs. We would play at the Naval Base out in Millington, and, and that was good money, and it was a week at a time. But, you, you know, you couldn't just go out there and play smoke on the water all night long, and you can't take that to the country club. You, you got to have some for the good times, some stuff for the country club set to enjoy, you know, and mm-hmm. that was a hard, bless his heart, man. He just, he 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 was so steadfast, and we were just so non-cooperative. <laughs> Uh-huh. <laughs> you know, because we wanted to do what we wanted to do, and we thought we knew, and we we didn't. And and honestly, I I count that experience. I would call myself pretty well rounded. One of the major tools in in doing this job is when you throw your bucket down the well, being able to come up with something. Mm-hmm. You know, because it's a deep well. But as I look back, I'm grateful for that experience. Because it, it, it taught me a, a lesson that I still carry today, you know. Mm-hmm. It's all so did the past. band start playing a variety of different the, kind the of clubs did, and stuff? The band did, yeah. And, you know, it, it, it took on various forms and we went through various stages of being prog heads and, and, and hard rock heads and all this, that, and the other thing, blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. I'm going to tell this story. My cousins and I uh, went to a... Uh, rock festival in jackson tennessee at the rodeo arena i think nazareth was going to be there and blue oyster cult and the first band starts playing this band from st louis called pavlov's dog the b3s and anything like that uh and the mellotron were all way out of tune and it was a, it was a power issue it was they weren't getting enough voltage so they struggled through a set you know, get off stage and, and Nazareth wants to come on next because they want to get the heck out of Dodge. So they kick this song off and about halfway through the first song, everything stops. They, they finally get the power to turn back on. They get them back up, up on stage and they start the song again. And literally the exact same point in the song, it everything stops again. Oh, wow. And they're like, bye, we're sorry, we can't do this. So they split, right? And man, it, the, the natives are getting restless here, you know. It's and they get a civil defense generator <laughs> out there. Wow. But this is like at by this time we've all been sitting around three or four hours, you know. So they get this thing hooked up. Blue Oyster Cult sets up. They come on and play. They get through their whole set, and it's and it's really. I mean, they kick butt. It was really good. <laughs> There's another band from Memphis on this bill called Larry Raspberry and the High Steppers, and they had a deal on Enterprise Records. And I see them, they're setting up to come on next. The guy from the Civil Defense decides, enough's enough, I'm taking the generator back. Show's over. Everybody goes crazy. There's beer bottles flying everywhere. I mean, just, it's just insanity, right? Yeah. And people are just scurrying around. I run over to the fence where, you know, the high steppers are trying now to put the stuff back in the van, uh-huh. right? And <laughs> and I had their record. I loved their record. And I'll go, Larry, 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 man, I just want to tell you, I, I just I, I I love your record, man. I love your record. And and you know, I you know, I hate I'm not gonna get this blah 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 blah, you know. Just I wanted to tell him that anyway. So I did I tell him this. A couple of years later at the shop I'm working in in Memphis. And comes in the drum shop, and I said, and I recount this story to him. I said, "You remember the the Jackson riot concert?" And he's like, "Oh my gosh, it was horrible." I said, "Yeah, I'm, I met you there, and I just, you know, I was a big fan of your." And I said, "Man, I know all your songs. I just, I, I play along with them all the time. I know all your songs." He said, "Well, that's great. I appreciate that." Well, another year goes by. <laughs> We're in Knoxville, Tennessee, playing a prom. I get this phone call. It's Larry Raspberry. 
And I'm like, well, how'd you find me? He said, well, I called your mom. (laughs) (laughs) I said, well, what's going on? He said, man, I am in Madison, Wisconsin, and my drummer, who was Chad Cromwell at the time, has got to, I've got two weeks left on a tour, and he's got to leave the tour to have back surgery. You said you know my stuff. Can you come to Madison? I'm like, yeah, yeah, sure. I, and I haven't <laughs> asked my parents or anything, you know. <laughs> and uh, so we come home that Sunday, and I, I hit the door and all in a frenzy. I'm like, Mom, I, you know, well, she knows that he called, but she doesn't know what he's asked me to do. And uh, he, he, I tell tell him what's up, and they're like, I'd never flown before or anything. And they're like, well, you really think you should do this? I'm like, yes, I, I, yes, I should do this. I, you know, I love these guys. So I, I actually repacked my drum kit. I checked my drum kit as baggage, fly to Madison, Wisconsin, <laughs> and play with Larry. And, and kind of from that point on, I started playing with him. We wind up getting another record deal with Mercury and touring across the country and into Canada and all this stuff. And, you know, n- nothing really happened other than a bunch of great experience, learning experience, and started playing with a band called DeGarmo and Key, w- which were some of the early purveyors of pretty heavy gospel music. A couple of tours a year, record every year. At that point, I had never done anything I had recorded before but not with purpose, coming in high and tight. You know, you're hitting the hi-hat too hard, blah, 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 blah. You know, you have to learning how to balance yourself, you know, yeah. uh, and, not, and, and mainly not getting defensive about what someone's saying to you. They're telling you for your own good, right. <laughs> you know. Uh, and, and fortunately for me, the guys that uh, at Ardent Studios at the time were such great guys, John Hampton and Joe Hardy specifically. To be fearless in 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 some aspect, don't be af- don't be afraid to to try anything. It's all valid. This is all relative to choice. It's not it's not a hard fast rule book. You'll know if what you're doing is not working, and you'll know if it is working. I do the DeGarmon Key stuff. I, I wind up getting a call from Amy Grant, who who we had done a couple live albums with. And uh, and I just got a call out of the blue from her manager Dan Harrell, so I ch- I chose to to leave DNK and and do that tour and wound up being an eighteen month tour and a really successful tour, big arena tour, and it was a, an amazing experience. So I come come home off that tour, you know, some time goes by and start I start hearing rumblings that there might be you know going back out and no one's calling. Anybody remotely associated, I said, hey, have you heard anything about, you know, like, yeah, I've kind of heard some stuff. But I was, she got wind. I was curious as to what was going on. And and bless her heart, she called me. And they were changing the band again, and I was not going to be in it. I mean, that was kind of devastating. What impact did that have on, like, your, your confidence? And- I don't think it impacted my confidence as a player. I think it in- <laughs> impacted my confidence as a person. What have I done? What What is it about me as a person that is not wanted to be a part of this? And 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 as it turns out, it was never really any of that. You know, they had a path they were on, and 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 they never promised me anything more than that one tour. But I had always been of the opinion. You do your job well, the reward will be continuing to have a job. <laughs> okay, so this is what real self-employment is about. I am all I have. It ain't my gig. I work at the pleasure of those who are hiring me. You know, things happen, and, and I have to remind myself of this very lesson. You know, like if you've, you've been in sessions, uh, you've done a number of records with somebody, and they've been very successful, and then... You know, you look up and they're back in the studio and you're not. And I just have to go, you know what? We did good. I did everything I could while I, you know, was with them. 
music is really personal, man. And you get vested in someone's program and, and what you're doing and you're creating a sound and you're creating a style and, and a voice. And it, and it ain't just commerce. You know, it's not. There's a, a level of uh, involvement there that's deeper than or, or should be for it to really amount to anything to me. It's, it's never just been commerce. That lesson is, was the first time I realized, okay, it's me and me. At that point, I have a little studio in Memphis. I'm playing in three different bands, three nights a week engineering jingles, doing everything I can in the studio, can't really do any more than I'm doing, and I can't make any more than I'm making doing what I'm doing. I get I get a phone call one day uh, from Scott Hendricks, Faith Hill. They were trying to put her first band together. Chad gave me your number and said, I should give you a call and see if you might want to come up and just play and see what you think, and we'll see what we think, and all that. And I'm, at the time, I'm like, yeah, whatever. Yes. Okay. Because I'm just looking for anything, right? Uh, so I, I come up and we go to SIR and they've, they've got every position filled but the drummer. They don't have the drummer. And I, we might have played two songs. And, and they said, well, you want to do this? <laughs> I'm like, well, what what is this? <laughs> what what does this mean? And it was the typical thing of her first record was coming out, and they had to be ready to tour and do TV and blah 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 blah. Yeah, I, I signed up to do that. A, a bunch of stuff coalesced at the time. Uh, Norbert Putnam was was bringing me up. I had worked with Norbert in Memphis on on a Jimmy Webb thing. He had booked me for a week of 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 double scale. I didn't have a clue what that meant. I, you know, I didn't know. When that um, that pay envelope came in, and and we saw it, you know, my wife and I opened it and saw it. It was just like, you got to be kidding me. That was. He said, "Yeah, and you know, you can do this most weeks of the year, but you have to be here." And at that point, the choice became really obvious. That's the really long story of how I wound up in Nashville. Were there any challenges that you that you remember kind of encountering as you got into this world of, you know, playing on big records consistently? And the really the biggest challenge was is just creating a level of comfort on a studio floor full of people that had no clue who I was. I'm just someone they've never even heard of, right. you know, and never played with and don't know anybody that's played with him sitting down and being calm and playing my thing and letting them judge for themselves what they think. There was nothing you could say or nothing you could do until you sat down and they, and they felt you. So as you started getting into, you know, playing on, on more records and stuff, you know, you, you had mentioned that one of the things that you learned at Arden from, you know, the engineers there was dynamics and that sort of thing. Um, can you share a little bit more about like kind of coming from the live world into the studio world and some of the specific things that you learned about how to approach the drum set from a, for a recording standpoint? Well, the main thing I learned is, is they, they are two very different arenas of listening in a recording. There's only so much room. It's a much more focused listening. There's a level of selectivity that you have to learn and exercise and, and know where to trim the fat. You know, live, there's the distraction of the visual and the energy of the audience and the energy of the band and all of that stuff. I guess self-editing is the is the best term for it. How much does, that, the, does the plane, does the dynamics of your hands versus like the, the treatment of the drum set itself have an impact in the studio setting? All the way back in some of the earliest days of, of rock and roll and all this stuff, you listen to Little Richard Records or Elvis Records or all this it may just be he's within six feet of the vocal mic. So if he's not balancing himself, he's not going to be balanced. But that's that's also playing music, too. That's just being musical, blending yourself. There was absolutely that moment on that first High Steppers record, and it had to do with the hi-hat. You know, I had it in my mind. I wanted to play 15-inch sound edge hi-hats that just 
demolished the snare drum. We take the 15-inch sound edge hats off and put a pair of 14 new beats on and a little bit of tape on them. It even comes down to placement, you know, setting the kit up, uh, you know, not having the ride cymbal three inches above the floor tom. Well, what's that going to do to the floor tom? How's he even going to get a mic in the floor? You know, you have to, you have to come to grips with uh, physics of all of that. You know, you got to have space accessible to, to cover this stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, and 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 you you just learn all that. You know, you learn all that by doing and and failing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can change a lot just by changing the symbols. I mean, mm-hmm. that changes the, the the completely the air on top of the track. What 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 are your kind of go to uh, options for for symbols, and why would you choose them? The thing that I've consistently used most, Bosphorus traditionals are very responsive and and they are very living you know when you strike it you feel it you 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 feel it respond in your hand you hold it on your finger and tap it and you just it just you know all that stuff goes up your arm it's like this is alive this is a living instrument here lately i've been playing uh, the istanbul agops and and they're they're the same they're kind of the same thing for me. What makes a good like recording snare drum? What's what's your your opinion on that? I keep a number of them on a date, and they they kind of are all tuned specifically to a thing that 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 they kind of do best. So I don't really mess with them that much. You know, I've got mm-hmm. gushy ones. I've got nice kind of mid range dry ones, and then I have you know high and tights. And how much of the tuning of a of a drum is based on? maybe the size or the material or just like you pick up a drum and you, you kind of hit it and you're like, this feels like where this should, where this should sit. The drum will tell you just like, just like Tom's will tell you, you know, a a 10 is not going to sound like a 14. Everything has a range and a sweet spot. And basically I just try to find what that is for that particular instrument. I have an idea that my five inch wood shell power tone, because I've heard it, you know, on records forever and ever, I, I kind of know what it's supposed to be doing, you know, so I put it there and that's where it stays. So if you were putting together like a, a snare collection for yourself now and, and had minimal budget and needed to figure out what are the mainstay sort of things that well, I Well, it to- would start with a superphonic. You can do more with it across the spectrum than just about any drum. It'll get fat. It'll get tight. You'd, you'd want to have something to give you that fat kind of eagle Z kind of later day Ringo thuddy kind of what kind of drum do you use for that it's it's basically just it's the it's the snare that came with the kit studio king kit it's just a six and a half by 14 but it's tuned all wonky there's a sweet spot in tensioning the snare wires it sounds choked initially until you go past that point <laughs> and then it and then it kind of gives you a double whack I was needing something fat. So basically, I just started loosening the top head, patting it down, and and then at the same time, I was dinking with the snare tension. Basically, it was too loose, you know, because it was rattling way too much. And as I tightened it, it it kind of it's like ah, this is going to choke out. And then I just went a little past it, and all of a sudden, it changed into this other thing. I'm like, oh, that's pretty dang cool. What sort of approach do you take with Tom's? The drums I use, for the most part, are a little on the big side, I think. It's a 24 and a 14 and a 16. I tune them more up, and, and, and that's kind of the bottom thing. He used big drums, but he didn't tune them low. The bigness of that sound is, is because the drums are full-throated. They're making a bunch of sound because they're not flapping around down there producing nothing it's like with bass drums i go to these studios that have house kits and they've got the bass drum heads just barely on the drum because they think oh it's low it'll be so low it'll be and it's like no it's not it's just that you're just hearing that there's no tone there you, all you're hearing is a slap sometimes i won't say anything i'll just kind of bring the head up a little bit you know and get it where it's there's a sound <laughs> mm-hmm. and and just almost inevitably the engineer will come, oh man, kick drum sounds great today. What'd you do to it? And I was like, I just, you know, brought it up a little bit. 
don't make a big deal out of it. But mm-hmm. your drum set, I feel like, is is quite legendary. How has it become as popular as you are? Well, it, oh, it's way more popular than I am. <laughs> it really is. It's seafoam green, you know, so all the guitar players love it because it's seafoam green. It's a Slingerland Studio King kit that was made here in Nashville back when Gibson owned them. No magic wood layups. It's just maple. And I remember setting them up maybe at the house and trying to get them ready and thinking, I don't know, man, because those drums at the time came with die cast hoops on them, which I was I had always been a fan of because with Gretsch, I was always a big Gretsch guy. They weren't liking it. And I remember running out to World Max, a reproduction of the old Slingerland stick saber hoop. And I grabbed a set of those hoops and took them home and put on those drums. And it immediately changed everything. Having less mass at that point, top and bottom, that's the single thing with that kit that that changed everything on it. How have you learned to understand the, the creating a large size for the drums while still fitting into the, the track? There's an allowable sonic space for drums. Man, listen to that resonance. That thing ring, you know, do. Okay, well, after do, he ain't going to let that be there because it's taken up everything. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. If it's not going to be there, I just don't put it there. So a drummer might think the harder I play and hit, the bigger my drums are going to sound, the more powerful they're going to sound. To a point. You can absolutely beat the sound out of anything. Acoustic guitar players, you know, just banging the acoustic guitar and it bending sharp every time he hits it. Drums are the same way. You can only hit them so hard and get any more than you're getting. It can't give you any more, and you're stopping it from giving you what it wants to give you. That's the overall, your touch on your instrument. That's what you develop over the, a span of time. In a session, producers playing down the work tape, artists is listening. What are the things that you're starting to discern from that and how do you determine what you go in to step out on the floor and start playing for me it all starts with the point of the song you have to know what the song's trying to do when that process starts it's like a a little movie starts playing in my head i'm seeing this play out i'm seeing the song play out and what we're going to do and where it might go and what the feel might be if it's a full flesh demo or if it's just a acoustic and vocal it's going to present itself really that's where the throwing the bucket in the well comes in. It's like, oh, it's this. And then you get in, you're playing the first take. What are the things that you're listening to within the band for the foundation of what you're, of what, what you're going to play and how that impacts? That's a little bit of a hard one. People arrive at their things at different, in different paces. A guitar player, it may be three or four rundowns. You may not necessarily have a vocal that you can tell anything by. An artist written song and they're there to sing it, they know it, but sometimes it's not that way. You know, sometimes it's an outside song and, and the artist doesn't quite know it like they're going to as, as they sing it. I'm obviously listening to the band, but I think really I'm listening to me to see if there's anything readily evident that I know I need to change. Just so to, you're zeroing in on on your own on your own part and recognizing that it, that it's going to take a few takes for the the band to get there. So you're not making drastic decisions right away. No, no. And like, no. oh, well, I need to change this accent here because the guitar player's right no, hand no, is doing no. this. No, no, it's not that time yet. It's not okay. that time yet. A lot of the times there'll be pre-production and programming and stuff like that, and a, and an arrangement comes in set in stone. It's solid, mm-hmm. a, a, and that's a whole different ball game as far as parts and all that stuff, because mm-hmm. if, if that's there, I know I'm playing to a, a, a known quantity. I, I take notes mm-hmm. and it's like, all right, I'm going to grab that. I'm going to grab that. I'm going to grab that. Right. So in that position, what are some of the things that, <laughs> that you're going to, that you're going to grab or pay? Just to? phrases, any, anything, anything that reaches out to me and says, Hey, this can be a moment. If there's an interesting turn of a vocal phrase, sometimes I like to do something around that to kind of bring attention to that. And do you do that to bring attention before or after it, or do you do it to like Sometimes bring attention by supporting whatever that. it is? They're doing? It's, it's, yeah, it's just that. I try not to step on it. So when it comes to, to gang licks or like band parts where everyone is playing a, playing a part together, what are, what are you listening for to determine whether or not you're like 
zeroing in on exactly that versus giving something that's like a a root or foundation for them to do that over the top of it? Really, the initial thing is, is how busy is that lick? If it's something really over the top, I'm just going to accent under it at given points of emphasis, Mm -hmm. you know, because every, everybody can't do little, 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 you know, more often than not, the producer will say, this is going to be a gang lick. When you're in a session and you have an idea of how this should be approached based on your instinct and that well that you can, you know, you can pull from and you are completely confident that you go through this take and you're like, that was awesome. And that take ends and there's silence on the talk back for a moment. And then someone says something to the extent of, that's ah, not really what we're, where we're, you know, we're going with this, but you feel in your gut that it's there. Where do you draw the line between the, the distinction of just yes, sir. And, um, saluting and doing your thing versus sort of like giving a perspective and sharing some insight on maybe how, how something could be tried to. First of all, I, 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 w- I would wait to see if anything was identified as being lacking. If someone is not addressing me specifically, I'm just going to stay with that part. Ask the engineer or the second, hey, keep that drum pass. Just for There was a couple of things in that I might want to hear later. But keep that pass, you know, not Mm -hmm. saying I really think that was the pass. Just keep it as a point of reference. It it can be frustrating, but once again, you just, it gets back to that thing of, okay, it's not your gig. You know, you're here to serve, so serve. One of the things is the ring out has gone down and, and the first thing someone will say is, if that's our take, don't even plant that seed. Don't use the term if, let them decide if it's the take. (laughs) One of the other things is at the end of a take, most of the band has done a really good job, but maybe a guy or two is still struggling when that song ends and they immediately start working on on the thing they screwed up as the ring out's happening. Don't blow the take up for everybody else. Let it stop. Then you can work on your thing. In the early stages of getting in on sessions, players are really eager to like find the perfect part and could maybe even be a little nervous and and almost like changing their part a little too quickly. If everybody's doing that, you're chasing your tail. Then nothing's the same the next time you play it. So everything you've changed to try to play to is gone. Trust yourself. Mainly, if you're struggling to find something, just stop for a minute and, and listen. Rather than trying to shoehorn something in there, so it doesn't really do any good to let it work you up. At that point, you're just you're just going to have to ride it out. You don't want to cause uh, distress, create pressure on someone who's already feeling pressure. They'll get there. So in addition to the, the, the challenges of learning the skills that are required to get in on a session and deliver and serve the artist's vision of the song, the other thing that can be challenging is really just like navigating a career as a, as a musician. There's can be a roller coaster ride of you know calls nonstop, phone stops ringing, building these relationships, and then people moving you know on to different you know options and that sort of thing. As you yeah. mentioned you know previously, what do you feel like has allowed you to have such a long sustained uh, career at a very high level? I don't let things weigh on me. Observations on 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 people you grow up with. And you see how it affects them long term. And I think you just say, I don't, I don't want that years down the road still fretting over a, a slight, you know, or a perceived slight. The ups and downs, I mean, it's, it can be tough. Find your level of acceptance to your situation because that's common, uh, in, especially in this field. There's a career curve. To, to this. And it's mm-hmm. based on a number of things. It's not necessarily a reflection of your ability or lack thereof. The business changes. The people you work for change. As new people come in, they bring new people with them. Well, you've gotten into home recording as well. Oh, yeah. What type of setup do you have, like interface and mics? My interface is a Motu 24IO. It's a single rack space, 24 ins and outs, it, I, and, and it's just amazing. I have uh, some Burl Mic Pre's, Avitas MA5s, I think they are. I've got a rack of Spectrosonics, old 70 Spectrosonics that actually came from 
one of the consoles we had back in Memphis in the late 70s. You're going to laugh at this, but but they're really good. PV made a two-channel tube mic pre years ago back in the 90s. Tube mic pre, tube EQ, just a, a bass and a treble control, not like radical EQ, just like tone controls. I use them on my overheads and one of my room, my far room, I use KSM44s, sure, for my overheads, a large diaphragm condenser. I have a C37 transistor version on my hi-hat, 57 top and bottom snare, D112 kick, uh, and then a sub kick, 421s on the two toms, Audio Technica 4041 on my ride cymbal, a pair of Cascade fat heads with the Lundahl transformers six feet in front of the kit mm -hmm. for immediate room. And then I've got a, a Neve, one of those active Neve ribbons that SE makes mm -hmm. uh, for the far room. So when you were younger, you were, you worked at a drum shop. I did. Was there anything that you found was really valuable in that environment? Or it was neat to, to have s such red ready uh, exposure to all the different manufacturers and and, and kind of just see the nuance difference in, in what people were making. And I met amazing players w was the thing, you know, on a local level and on a national level because it was a very popular shop. And so anybody that came to town was coming in to the shop, how they handled themselves or didn't. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, depending. Yeah. You got you got both. That's it's another part of the learning thing. It's like, do I want to be this or do I want to be that? How do I, you know, how do I want people to think about me mm -hmm. <laughs> if they ever think about me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's been a common uh, topic where we, we've discussed the different ways that different players have sort of inserted themselves in communities. Can't really like open up the paper and go to an interview to be a session drummer. Oh no, you no. know. But working at the music shop is one unique. Uh, example of that that I've heard so far about just the you know the thing that you're just doing something that you enjoy doing anyway but rec you you can look back on it now and sort of recognize well yeah being in that environment was incredible because it introduced me to this community that I wanted to to be a part of yeah absolutely it did you you were recently um in the in the band uh, for Su Seegers was it, it was his last tour uh, according or, to him it according was to, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing it, it was amazing I mean everything about it was like a fairy tale from from how they even called me to to just literally the whole thing as I look back. How'd you end up getting the gig? I had a couple of friends. It seems to always start that way, doesn't it? <laughs> Jim Brown and uh, and Rob McNelly. And there had been a couple of instances in years past. Jim had mentioned my name to him. The ACMs did the honors night, mm -hmm. studio guys and producers and stuff like that, and they'd have the ceremony at the Ryman. They generally always tried to get the winners to come be the house band. And Shannon had won this year. They asked me to come sub for him. Jim Brown had won that year, so he was he was playing. Seeger knew that Jim was going to be playing, so he he's tuning in to watch this thing. And Seeger called him and said, hey, I saw you on the show. Who was the drummer? <laughs> And Jim said, well, that's Greg. Two weeks after that broadcast, his day-to-day -day guy, Bill Blackwell, called me and said, hey, Bob wanted me to call you and see if you thought you might be interested in maybe coming up and playing a little bit. And I said, well, duh. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and he sent me some CDs, Bob did, that he labeled himself in his handwriting. Oh, right. I'm like, boy, you couldn't write this in a story. At the time, Don Brewer had been playing drums for him forever. Do you know you know Donnie, right? Mm -hmm. You know who Donnie is. Yeah. Well, he he was my guy growing up. I mean, he and Jerry Edmonton and Floyd Sneed basically. So I I know I know this at this point. It's like, oh dude, I'm gonna go up there playing this stuff that Donnie's been playing. Oh my gosh. And I don't know what prompted me to do this, but I, I learned everything on the CDs and then I learned some extra stuff too. I get to the rehearsal and the first probably four things he called were not on the CDs he sent me. It just clicked really quickly. Chris, the bass player, said, hey, Bob, can we keep him? <laughs> and everybody was just kind of dying laughing. And, I'm like, and that's the fulfilling thing about it, you know, to, to be dropped in a situation where these people have been together 
30 odd years and to make them feel like nothing is out of place was the whole goal. It's in any, any venue. It's that, mm-hmm. you know, and yes, it's, it's very noticeable in the session world, but, but really it's anytime you're playing music with anybody to hear 20,000 people a night singing every word with you all night long. What an amazing experience. It, it was just amazing. Yep. Just, and it was a no frill show. There were no click tracks. There were no computer aid, you know, no tracks running. If you heard it sung or played, someone sang or played it. And, and that was very gratifying too. Did you define for yourself or sort of recognize if I'm doing this, then I feel successful and I can feel excited and, and fulfilled in life and in my career? Well, the goal was always a job well done. Just kind of knowing that you're striking that common chord with the people you're playing with and the people you're playing to. Music is not just commerce. It's a different level of communication and vocabulary and emotion. Getting to share on that level is the fulfillment. Understanding that, that it's not just commerce, where that comes from, feels like it is what really leads to the commerce working itself out and being able to make a living from it. For me, I know it's that way. Well, thank you so much for doing this interview with us. Uh, It was was amazing to hear what I didn't know about you and to discuss, you know, some really great topics that I think will be really valuable for the people that are listening. And well, man, I appreciate it. I'm honored to be here and and, uh, uh, I'm honored to be a part of everybody else that you've had in this share. And it's great. I appreciate it very much. Yeah, man. Thank you.